All right, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes, good. So um, it sounds like a lot of you are interested in volcano deformation, which is one of the areas I work in. And so what I had planned to do this morning was to give a little bit of background motivation and then talk a little bit about the steps we go through for this very famous source model called the Mogi source, which is probably the most widely used model to describe volcano deformation. And the emphasis is going to be a little bit on what the assumptions are that goes into this model so we understand what the basis is. And then I'll be uh, talking again tomorrow. And uh, I just want to invite you, first of all, again, to ask questions. And also, if there are particular things that, that um, you want to hear about, and many of you know I've written a book on uh, earthquake and volcano deformation. I have a chapter on volcano deformation. Some of these are a little bit hard to go through, some of these topics in a short amount of time. But if there's something specifically that's of interest, let me know, and we'll see if we can squeeze in a little bit, or I can talk to you individually. So uh, again, I want to start with just a little bit of motivation. I'm not going to spend too much time going through a, a lot of examples. But um, so I assume most people are aware of the sort of basic idea that is we could measure how the Earth's surface deforms as magma rises from the mantle ultimately being stored in crustal reservoirs. And uh, as pressure within a magma chamber increases, this tends to cause the ground surface to swell. We call that inflation. And that can be measured with a variety of, of methods nowadays, mostly GPS and INSAR. It seems like there are a lot of INSAR folks in the audience today. Um, ultimately, when the conditions are such that either a dike can propagate from the magma chamber or magma can force its way to the surface, we can get an eruption. That will cause the pressure within the magmatic system to decrease, and we end up with deflation. So in many volcanoes, we see these inflation-deflation cycles. This is from Kilauea volcano during the uh, early part of the current er uh, eruption episode, all the way back in 1983. And this shows a tilt record with up being inflation, so tilting away from the volcano as pressure increased, as magma was stored, and then the sudden tilt drops, these deflationary events were associated with eruptive phases during this uh, early part of the eruption. So the measurements we make, either with GPS, INSAR, TILT, or a variety of other methods, are things that we want to compare. We want to understand what's going on in the subsurface, and we need mathematical models to describe the relationship between what happens in the magmatic system with what we can measure at the surface. And so this, this famous MOGI model is actually an approximate representation of a spherical pressurized cavity within a fully elastic medium. Now, whenever you, I see this kind of picture uh, and think about what maybe real magma chambers look like, this is somebody's cartoon of what maybe a, a more realistic magma chamber geometry might be. Clearly, this is not what we think a real <laughs> magma chamber looks like. In fact, it always reminds me of the joke about you know, you've all heard versions of this that ends with the punchline of postulate a spherical cow or something like that. So this is like postulate a spherical magma chamber. Why do people use this model other than it's been around for a long time? Uh, two reasons, I would say. One is that you end up with very simple expressions for both the vertical and radial uh, displacements at the surface that we'll see end up being related to the volume change. That is, the amount of either intruded or extruded volume within the magmatic system. So they have very simple expressions. And actually, in many cases, they fit data reasonably well, this, this very simple model. And so this is a, a radar interferogram from Darwin Volcano in the Galapagos uh, many years ago. And this is the best fitting MOGI source model. So you can see it, it represents uh, the data very well. More generally, what we can learn from these kinds of measurements it turns out that the shape of the magma system, the magma chamber, does uh, control the ratio of horizontal to vertical displacement. In fact, sill-like sources that are relatively flat tend to push up and exert a lot of relative vertical deformation relative to horizontal, whereas things like stocks or pipes 
push outward more, and so you get less vertical relative to the radial. So um, we can use that then uh, information to learn a few things. In summary, what we can get from these kinds of measurements usually is something about the depth of the source, the pressure source, some limited information about the geometry, again, whether it tends to be more sill-like or more stock-like. Uh, the exception being dikes. Dikes have very distinctive deformation patterns, something like this, because as the crack uh, moves into the crust, it pushes the walls aside, and that gives rise to very characteristic both vertical and horizontal displacement. We could get, as I said, information about the volume change, how much magma has been added or subtracted from the system, not the total volume, although we'll talk about that. So the, some of the things we can't get at are the absolute chamber volume, how much magma is there. From a volcanological spec perspective, that's something we'd very much like to know, how much eruptable material is actually there. Turns out to be also difficult to get at pressure in an absolute sense. And of course, these models are essentially kinematic, so they don't have predictive capability. And we'll come back to that tomorrow. So now I want to go through just a few examples showing deformation leading to eruptions. This is um, from the Galapagos uh, Sierra Negra volcano. Deformation there was first found uh, with INSAR measurements and then campaign GPS and ultimately continuous GPS. You can see very rapid uh, changes here, uplift of the floor of the caldera leading to an eruption uh, back in when was it, Cindy? I don't remember exactly. But we can focus in on the, a little bit more on the details here, showing um, actually a very interesting sequence of faulting events that preceded the eruption, but dramatic changes in the deformation leading up to the eruption. So magma was filling the system. Pressure was increasing going towards the eruption. A uh, similar thing for uh, the uh, eruption in Iceland. We all call Aya because it's too hard to pronounce the full name. Uh, so again, interferograms, GPS time series, the eruption is somewhere over here. Rather dramatic changes indicating that magma was being stored in the, in the near surface prior to that eruption. Uh, as I mentioned, dikes are rather different. This is an interferogram from an intrusion into the upper east rift zone of Kilauea volcano. And I love this uh, butterfly pattern here because it very much shows these two uplift lobes. As the uh, dike is, is intruding into the crust, it's pushing aside by the Poisson effect. You get uplift on both flanks. And that's shown in the calculation here. And you can see those two uplift lobes on either side of the rift zone uh, there. Again, these uh, signals precede eruptions, so they're precursory in that sense. Uh, there's a lot going on on this slide. Some of this is tilt data, some of this is GPS, but we see tilt downward here as magma started leaving the summit magma chamber, intruded into the rift zone, propagating earthquake swarm going out. These two GPS sites here eventually started moving apart. That's what this time series. So first deflated up near the summit, meaning magma moved out, was intruded into the rift zone, and ultimately these two stations started moving apart as the dike propagated uh, down rift. I think in the interest of time, I'll skip this one last example and then just go now and talk about uh, the derivation of this Mogi source model. Okay, And that's what we'll spend the rest of our, our time on. So this is, as I said, is a, a highly simplified model. And it looks something like this. We're going to imagine an elastic material with a free surface here. So the tractions on the surface vanish. And we have a spherical cavity of radius A, whose center is at depth D within uh, an elastic half space. Okay. And there's some pressure applied to the boundary of this, of this cavity we'll call P. So it could be a, a change in pressure, 
but we're going to imagine whatever the initial stress state is, it's self-equilibrated. So there's some equilibrium stress that, that equilibrates all the body forces that are acting on the system. And now we add pressure P, but because this is an elastic system, everything is linear and we can superpose different solutions. So we're only looking at the change as mass is added or subtracted uh, to the cavity. Okay? So we're going to imagine that outside here, this is fully elastic. It's linear. And just to keep everything simple, we're going to assume it's homogeneous and isotropic. That means its properties don't vary as a function of, of position. So the governing equations here are, again, we always have, as, as Michael emphasized, we have conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. We don't have an energy equation in this case. We're assuming everything is isothermal. We're not worrying about heat transfer. Um, and we're going to then write the equilibrium equations in the standard way. Uh, the divergence of the stresses So if people aren't familiar with the tensor notation, you might check with me afterwards. We'll talk about this. It's saying the divergence of the stresses plus body forces vanishes. So I don't have an inertial term in this equation. Why not? There's no, hmm? Yes, OK. That's exactly right. So we're going to assume that these are so-called quasi-static, that these displacements, these deformations, occur slowly enough that we can neglect the inertial terms in the equations of motion. So there actually should be a term over here that's density times the, the total derivative of velocity with respect to time. But we're going to look at the limit where this is approximately 0. Okay, so these are taking place slowly. We cannot. In this calculation, therefore, look at radiated waves, elastic waves, for example, from this, assuming the deformations <laughs> occur slowly. Um, so let's think about the boundary conditions here. Um, the boundary conditions acting on the wall of this cavity, suppose we erect a spherical coordinate system that's centered on the chamber, we would have that the radial stresses evaluated on the boundary would be equal to minus the pressure. Why minus? Because I use a tension positive stress convention. So we push here, pressure P induces a compressive stress, sigma RR. Okay. And this, this fluid, the magma that's within the magma chamber is static, so there are no viscous stresses being exerted on the wall. And therefore, the shear stresses, r theta and r phi, are exactly 0. This is on r equals a. And then, as I mentioned here, we have um, this is a free surface. This is representing mathematically the surface of the Earth. So all the tractions that act here are zero. So in a, in a Cartesian system, uh, sigma i3 equals zero on z equals zero, where i is one, two, three. So the, the vertical normal stress vanishes. Well, it's atmospheric pressure, but that's effectively zero. So we'll treat that as zero. And there are no shear stresses acting on this plane z equals zero. OK, so this, this turns out to be to solve this problem exactly is actually rather complicated. And you can think about it because we'd like to be in a spherical coordinate system here to, to solve this part of the problem. But here we have this Cartesian boundary over here that we need to match the free surface boundary conditions. And so that would be sort of awkward in a spherical coordinate system. So even this highly simplified model for an elastic homogeneous medium is actually difficult to solve analytically. And the, the, the Mogi solution is actually an approximate solution. And that approximation is going to turn out to be accurate 
in the limit that the radius over the depth is small compared to zero. So A over D is small, sorry, small compared to one, I should have said. Now, the derivation I'm going to outline is one that was presented in a paper by Dave McTighig back in the 1980s. And I like it because it illustrates sort of conceptually how we can think about building this and it allowed him to go to higher order approximation in the Moden solution. But we'll walk through it even though this is historically not how this equation was actually derived. In fact, there were, there were papers written before Mogi, uh, a whole series of uh, very important papers, and yet it was Mogi's name that got attached to the solution. So the, the procedure is going to be as follows. What we're going to do is we're going to derive a solution for the full space, pretending that the free surface isn't there at all. Okay, so step one is going to be the full space solution. And then step two, we're, we're going to correct for free surface. So we're going to solve this problem in spherical polar coordinate system centered on the magma chamber, pretending the surface is not here. Then we're going to find out that there are actually stresses, both shear and normal stresses, that act on the plane z equals zero. Then we'll say, well, let's add equal and opposite stresses to that boundary. Now we'll satisfy the boundary conditions here. But of course, when we do that, we'll now violate the boundary conditions on the surface of the magma chamber. And that, that's why it's approximate. We could imagine going back and forth and back and forth, fixing up the boundary conditions here, ruining them over there, fixing them here, ruining them over here, and just iterating back and forth. But we'll only do one, one step of that. OK, so this equation here, and, and by the way, we're also going to ignore body forces for the time being, because we imagine that the initial stress state equilibrates all the body forces in the system. Now, it may seem paradoxical that we can ignore gravity uh, in this calculation, but if someone wants to raise that at the end, we'd come back and talk about why we can neglect gravity as a first approximation. So this equation represents conservation of momentum or balance of forces in the continuum. It alone is not sufficient to give us a solution. We need more information. What information are we missing at this stage? Sorry? Elastic properties. Elastic properties. We need, first of all, more generally, we need a constitutive equation. We need something that relates stress and strain, or stress and strain rate, if that were the case. We're assuming this is elastic, so we're going to write that the stresses, sigma ij, 2u, epsilon ij, plus lambda, kk, delta ij, where mu is the shear modulus, lambda is the other Lemay constant. And in this case, with a full space solution, we have radial symmetry, and so there are only two strains, that is the radial strain, epsilon rr, which is the derivative of the radial displacement with respect to R. And the hoop strains, the theta theta and phi phi, which are equal by symmetry, spherical symmetry, so the two directions are the same. And it turns out those displacements, sorry, those strains are UR over R. So we can substitute this into Hooke's law and get the stresses in terms of gradients and displacement. Right? The spherical symmetry, this is expanding out, so the only non-zero displacements are UR. There are no displacements in the theta or phi directions. OK, so. Um, if you start with the equilibrium equations, the general equilibrium equations, we can show that they reduce with, for spherical symmetry. Uh, in general, these are how many equations 
here. It's a tensor system, so these are how many? Hmm? Three, right? So these are three equations because we have one free subscript we're summing over J. The repeated indices are summed over. So this re represents balance of forces in a Cartesian system in you know, X, Y, and Z, three different directions. Because of symmetry, there's only one uh, non-trivially satisfied equilibrium equation, and that is, looks like this. So there are two other equilibrium equations, but because of the symmetry, they're automatically satisfied. So this is the only one that's non-trivially satisfied. We take Hooke's law and these equations substitute into here, and we end up with a differential equation. Uh, in R. And I'm going to leave it to you as an exercise to uh, deduce this, and then from these equations uh, get to here. It's total, using total differential now because there are no, all the derivatives with respect to theta and phi are trivially satisfied. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. My, right. So this is above the last. Yeah, these are R. R. Sigma R R minus sigma theta theta. Stress. Sigma R R stress minus the sigma theta theta stress. See, these are all in the notes if you don't want to rewrite these down. Okay, so we've taken an equilibrium equation in terms of stress through the constitutive law. These are kinematic relationships that relate strain and gradients and displacement. This is a constitutive equation for an elastic meeting saying stress and strain are linearly proportional. And from these, we can derive a single equilibrium equation in terms of displacements now. So this is a first order ODE. We can integrate that, and I won't let you, again, let you do that. And we end up with the radial displacement having two terms, which I'm going to write as uh, like that. OK, it's a second order equation. We end up with two constants, A and B. And now we have to figure out what A and B are. So what about A do we notice? And what about this term? Should be zero. Should be zero. Why? Right. The displacement has to be finite as R goes to infinity, right? Because this is an infinite medium. So we have to set that term equal to 0. Now, if it was not an infinite medium, then we might have to worry about that. But in this case, we, we're looking at the solution in full space. It extends infinitely far away from the source. So we're still left with one constant. How are we going to determine that constant? It's the boundary condition, right? So we have a boundary condition. The boundary condition is in terms of stress. The radial stress has to match the pressure on the cavity wall. Okay. So I skipped some steps here, but we can write the um, the 
the, the radial stress. So sigma RR is twice the shear modulus dur dr. So we take the vertical, we take the derivative here with respect to radius. Uh, we're going to get minus 4 uh, b over r cubed. Right. This should be equal to minus p ah, sigma r r at r equals a should be minus p. And this is minus b over a cubed. So if I did that right, minus cancels minus, and b should be equal to um, p a cubed over 4u. Okay. And then we can put that back in to here. So the radial stress should be equal to minus p a over r cubed. And the, radi and the radial displacement, which is b over r squared, would be uh, minus 4, where are we? P A cubed over 4 U R squared. All right, so let's think about this. Dimensionally, does this make sense? On this side, we have stress. On the right-hand side, we have pressure. So we have units of stress. A over R is non-dimensional. So at least dimensionally, this makes sense, which is a sanity check. Right? And we find that, this, that the stresses decay as 1 over r cubed as we move away from the magma chamber. So the farther we, away we go, the stresses are going to decay quite rapidly as 1 over r cubed. Let's look at the displacements now. So we have units of length on this side. Pressure over modulus, so stress over stress. Okay. A cubed over R squared has units of length. So we have units of length on this side, units of length on that side. At least it passes the check of having the right units. Okay? Hopefully we did the algebra right. So everybody, any questions about this part so far? The reference frame is centered on the, on the, the source of the Exactly, right. So far, we have this centered on the source. So this is the full space solution. Now we've, we've done this, this step. Okay. So the good news is that's pretty straightforward. The bad news is we're done with the easy part. Now it's going to get harder. But we won't uh, do everything. Um, just outline how to do that. So the next thing we want to do then is we want to say, okay, what are the stresses acting on this z equals zero plane due to this, this um, magma chamber here expanding? And if I can erase this, right, we can see that there's the, the stresses are radial. In the full space, there's only a radial stress. So this is pushing out in a, in a radial sense. And um, so we get a radial displacement. And we, we're interested in decomposing that into a vertical displacement in a tangential horizontal component. And I'm going to call this direction the row direction. And so we want u rho, which would be the, the horizontal displacement on the free surface. And that will have cylindrical symmetry, right? So the displacement in and out of the board will be the same 
as parallel to the board or any other horizontal direction, but that's different from the vertical. Okay, now we can see we kind of have similar triangles here. We have a triangle here that's depth. Here's the radial distance r. R. And then we have a triangle here with radial displacement, vertical, and tangential. So that I can get the displacements the vertical displacement uz okay, over the radial but a similar triangle is, so that's this over that is proportional to the depth over the radial distance. Right? So that's equal to D over R by similar triangles. Okay. So all I'm doing is I'm taking the radial displacement and decomposing. This is still in a full space. Just decomposing it into vertical and tangential. Okay. Well, you are, for the full space, we have over here. So that's pi a cubed over 4 mu. And then we get d over r cubed. But r, by, by Pythagoras, r squared is d squared plus rho squared. So this is pi a cubed over 4 mu d over d squared plus rho squared to the 3 halves power. So this is the vertical. So again, pressure over modulus is non-dimensional. We have uh, length cubed over length cubed times distance. So this is dimensionally correct. And by the way, the, the tangential component is just rho over d cubed. So this over that instead of the vertical over that. So we have now the vertical and the tangential components. This is still in a full space. We've just taken the full space solution and decomposed it into two components in a uh, cylindrical coordinate system centered now over here. So we haven't fixed the free surface yet. Is that clear to everyone? I've just taken this and done a coordinate transformation, gone from spherical coordinates to cylindrical polar coordinates. All right. So the, the step now would be to compute what the stresses acting on the surface are. And they're, I'm not going to write them out, but they're going to be uh, vertical stresses, sigma zz. And then they're going to be shear stresses. So these are normal stresses. You can see we're, we're pushing up, so that's going to give compression here. And there will also be shear stresses. Uh, this would be on z equals 0. And they're both shear stresses. Rho z, uh, sorry, um, rho theta, etc., on z equals zero. And so, resolving those stresses, the full space solution stresses, which are these, it's just a transformation of coordinate system again, just like we did here. But now there's stresses, so we're dealing with a tensor instead of a vector. <coughs> 
And what McTighe did in the solution then is to apply equal and opposite stresses to this boundary. And a rather remarkable thing happens when you do that. The, the details are a little bit complicated. But the, um, in terms of the displacements, it turns out, and this is actually rather a general result, is you just multiply by 4, 1 minus nu. So the effect of negating the tractions that vertical and shear tractions that act on this surface in terms of the displacements on z equals 0 is you just take these solutions and multiply by 4, 1 minus, where nu is Poisson's ratio. It's not obvious, so don't expect to see that intuitively. That's just something that works out through the math. So in fact, then we end up with uz equals the, the 4 cancels the 4 in the denominator here. And we get 1 minus nu pi a cubed over shear modulus d over rho squared plus d squared to 3 halves. And similarly, with the, the tangential displacements, you just replace d with rho. And this is the Mogi solution. So to be clear, what we have done is exactly now match the boundary conditions on the surface. They are traction free. But when we apply uh, equal and opposite tractions on the plane z equals 0, we no longer exactly satisfy the radial stress is equal to minus the pressure. Okay. So that's, in, that's the reason this is an approximate solution. McTighe went one step farther and corrected those stresses, the stresses that we've added, negated those. But you see what's going to happen is those stresses are going to decay again, like A over R cubed. So by the time they reflect back up here, they're now proportional to A over R to the sixth power. So you skip two powers in the ratio of A over R, A over depth. And it actually turns out, even though this solution is approximate formally, as A over D should be much less than 1, it turns out to be pretty accurate even when A over D is on the order of, say, for example, a half. So it's not too terribly bad of an approximation. Because the stresses decay as you go away from the spherical cavity like A over R cubed. They decay so rapidly that you can actually, and if, maybe if we have time, I'll, I'll show you uh, a couple figures to show that. Yes, Michael. In, in that 4, 1 minus nu sentence, this sort of works out. Can, can we also get those expressions by putting the appropriate stresses in? Um, so you can generate that. What happens, so Michael's talking about an image, we could reflect by symmetry and put an image source, a distance d above the surface. And that would cancel the normal stress. But we'd still be left with shear stresses. So getting rid of the shear stresses is a little trickier. So there's no set of complicated images? Oh, there'd be complicated. Yes, you could do in the, in the limit that you represent this by a point force. Um, then there, there, there are series of images. There are ways of constructing these as images, but it's not trivial. Um, I should say, and we won't go through this, the way this was actually first derived is to approximate, and we could do that, um, by what's called a center of dilatation. In elasticity theory, there's something called the Green's function, which just gives us the displacement at some point, say here, due to a, a concentrated force acting in the medium. You call that a Green's function, right? So this is a concentrated force. It gives rise to displacement 
at some point. Now, you can construct higher order sources from superimposing point forces. So for example, I could get a double force, two equal and opposite forces, and a so-called center of dilatation which goes back uh, a long way in elasticity theory, would be three orthogonal force couples. So they pu pu push out equally in all directions. And in the limit that the radius of this cavity gets small, you can represent this as a superposition of double forces with no moment. This sort of interesting result turns out to be um, somewhat more general, but it only applies for sort of volumetric strains. It doesn't have to be spheres, but if you had uniform volumetric strain over some region, you could represent it that way. So I think the important point that I want to emphasize, what are the approximations? Linear elastic. So we're imagining that even as you get very, very close to this magma chamber where temperatures could be extremely high, this behaves in a linear elastic fashion. There's no viscous flow in the medium going on. Could you substitute a more complicated strain there? We could, and we will tomorrow. We'll include viscoelastic effects tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but for now, we've assumed that this is small strain linear elasticity. We've assumed that the material is homogeneous. It's isotropic. We neglected the effects of gravity. We've neglected pore structure, the fact that there could be fluids, water within the pores of the rock, or multi-phase fluids. And we've assumed that we have this limit where formally the radius of the magma chamber is small compared to its depth. So it's very idealized. Um, I will show, remind me before we leave, um, just how good the approximation is for uh, the, the depth getting relatively small. But before we do that, let's look at this structure here. So displacement, pressure over modulus, radius Q. So pressure, remember, this is really the pressure increment. This is the change in pressure because we assumed we were in some self-equilibrated state. Whatever happened before the pressure increase was in equilibrium. It wasn't accelerating off into space. And A cubed is proportional to volume for the spheres. So in some sense, this displacement looks like pressure times volume. So if all we're doing is measuring the displacements, if we wanted to figure out the volume of the magma chamber, we would have to know independently what the pressure change was. Or conversely, if we wanted to know how much the pressure was changing, we'd have to know what A was. So this is a feature of the solution that's kind of unfortunate because we'd like to know independently what these two things are. That would be very useful to us. But in fact, we only get them occurring as a product. And that turns out to be true for more general shapes. It could be ellipsoidal shapes or things like that. You're essentially insensitive to the total volume. Perhaps we can estimate A independently. If we could, that would be useful. And maybe you have some ideas about how we might do that. Maybe from seismic tomography, we might be able to figure out how big the magma chamber was. If we could, then we could say something about what the pressure increment was. Maybe we can put bounds on the pressure because we have physical constraints, but the pressure can't be so high that it, you know, it would break the rock or something like that. And that would tell us, well, the radius would have to be at least so large. We could put sort of physical constraints on what it would be. But from the displacements alone, we can't say um, independently what those are. Now, sometimes we see 
the Mogi solution written in a different way, and in fact, I have it over here in terms of volume change. So let's just show very quickly how that comes about. So again, if I go back to the full space approximation, how would I relate the volume change to um, knowing the displacement on the boundary you are evaluated at r equals a? Ignoring the free surface, just in the full space. The change in volume would be But generally speaking, it would be the integral of the displacements over the surface. That would be the, the first order approximation right, of the volume change. I would take the outward pointing displacement, integrate over the surface. Here we have symmetry, so it makes that integral particularly easy. So the surface area would be 4 pi a squared right, times the radial displacement you are evaluated at r equals a. Right, in the full space solution, which we had over here. So we get 4 pi a squared times pi a cubed over 4 uh, mu a squared. a cancels out, a squared, 4 cancels out. So delta V equals pi P A cubed over mu. Pressure over modulus is dimensionless, volume A cubed. So where I see this P A cubed over mu, I can just replace that with delta V over pi. So similarly, this could be written as in this form, 1 minus mu over pi. Distance cubed over you know, length cubed over length cubed, displacement proportional to distance. So either way, these are two equivalent representations. I can relate the displacements to the volume increment, the displacement at the surface, related to how much volume either moved into or out of the magma chamber, or I can relate it to this product of the pressure change times the radius cubed. Either of those is equivalent. But we've seen that I can't get uniquely at pressure or volume independently. So when you look in the literature, those of you that, that uh, fit data, you'll often see the data will satis be satisfied with a volume change of X number of million cubic meters of magma, either added or subtracted to um, the chamber. Okay. Any questions about that? Now, I, I do want to say one other thing about volumes, and, and that is that um, there are other volumes that one could compute. And by the way, these are what the displacements look like. So the vertical displacement decays in the following way. And so typically what you can do then is to, this is the scaled radial distance, the distance over the depth. And so typically what you do is you say go to where it falls to half the height 
you can work out exactly what that be. That will give you some information about the depth, how deep the source is. The radial displacement starts at zero, increases to a maximum, and goes up. Of course, by symmetry, it has to go to zero right above the source, the radial displacement. I was going to say there are two other volumes that come in. One is you could actually, and I don't know why you do this, but people have done it in the literature. You could take the vertical displacements and integrate them over the entire surface, and that will give you the delta V of the uplift. And paradoxically, it turns out that delta V of the uplift can be larger than the delta V of the magma chamber. I'll let you ponder that. And the other volume that, that people talk about is the, um, the volume of the mass, volume of the magma either added to or subtracted to the magma chamber. If the magma were incompressible, those two volumes would have to be equal. But magmas have uh, gases dissolved in them, and those gases will form bubbles. And the bubbles tend to be the gas phase, tends to be highly compressible. So due to the compressibility, it turns out that very oftentimes, if you add up all the magma that's erupted onto the surface, even the dense rock equivalent will be more than the delta V of the magma chamber from which it came because the magma itself is compressible. So you can't necessarily just eat the mass, right? We have conservation of mass. There's no conservation of volume law. It's How conservation. Do you explain dense rock equivalent? Dense rock equivalent means you just take out the pores. Right? Hmm? Of the erupted products. So volcanologists, petrologists call that the dense rock equivalent. So you may have a deposit that's 10 million cubic meters, but if it's 20% porosity, that's not you know, 10 million cubic meters of, of, of rock. OK, so this is a uh, figure from Dave McTighe's paper showing the, the uh, this is the vertical displacement and radial displacement. I call this order epsilon cubed. Epsilon here is A over D, the ratio of the radius to, to depth. Um, and this is for that ratio being 0.5. So this is not very, very small compared to one. It's a half. It's less than one, of course. It has to be less than one, but it's not very, very small. And you can see the difference in the displacements is rather modest. This plots the maximum uplift as a function of that radius. So you can see at a radius of 0.5, you know, you're talking a 15% correction. Given all the assumptions we've made about homogeneity, isotropy, flat free surface, neglecting a lot of effects, that's not a huge uh, correction factor. And it, again, it comes because the next higher order correction actually comes in at this ratio to the sixth power because things drop off as A over D cubed. Each time you skip two powers in, in that ratio. So if we were to look at then the stress state around the magma chamber, this is including the next order effect. This is showing the, um, the deviatoric stresses, the shear stresses. And these are the mean normal stresses. Actually, an interesting thing that happens in the full space solution, this expanding source is actually a pure deviatoric, pure shear stress source. I didn't emphasize that, but we, if we, we calculated the, um, the radial stress, it's compressive. If we had computed the hoop stresses, the theta theta stresses, um, they would be, I'm just going to write it, is minus one half sigma RR. So the cavity expands outward. The radial stresses are tensile. It's being stretched. As you expand out, the hoop stresses are tensile. And they're half in magnitude and opposite in sign. 
but because there are two of them, there's a theta theta and the phi phi, so when you add them all together, they're zero. So it's sort of paradoxical. This expanding source actually generates a pure shear stress. There's no mean normal stress change. And you can see that here in the contours of constant deviatoric stress are nearly spherically symmetrical, although the free surface does introduce a little bit of an effect. This is the mean normal stress. This is the trace of the stress tensor. You see it's completely due to the free surface. In a full space, it would be zero everywhere. So this is the, uh, right, and this is just showing that you can write this as an equivalent so-called center of dilatation. These, this triaxial point source representation is also equivalent to Loewy source. And this was the one that was actually derived first and is convenient to be used, for example, if you want to look at layered medium where the elastic properties are spatially varying. Uh, sometimes this representation is is very useful, although it is exactly equivalent in the limit to what we just derived. Any last questions? Okay. Lunchtime? <laughs>